the uh, speakers from this morning who are still here up to this table and we can have some question and answers and some interaction among you as a panel if you wish. Um, so we have until noon, 45 minutes, uh, if you don't mind, um, that would be great. So uh, Bill and Gita and Adam and Dan Wickler. Also, um, I'd like to make sure that when people get up to ask questions, they go to this microphone because we're trying to record the whole event. And uh, that way you can be sure everybody will hear you as well. So I'll, um, maybe you want to field questions or do you want me to? Um, so um, first let me, uh, since we have a little bit of time, let me ask you if any of the panelists would like to uh, say anything about what the other panelists said or to bring out themes that come up. Okay. Suffer undue financial hardship when they get needed care. If that is UHC, that is our goal. That's what we're striving for. And those that, that goal has two dimensions. Um, people then say, well, but that's not really UHC. Isn't it about, you know, isn't... Um, the Thai UC program, what we mean by UC. Or Julio, Frank, Dean Frank stood up earlier and say, Mexico has achieved universal coverage. And this is where it gets really confusing because, you know, what you, you, and, and Thailand says we achieved universal coverage, but, but they didn't actually. And sorry, Dean Frank, you haven't. Not, not in the sense that I'm using that term. What, what you did was to expand coverage to groups that had shallower coverage than other people. But we've no idea where we are in relation to the goals of universal coverage in the way I've described it. So what I'd like to do is say UHC is something we're striving towards. And, and by the way, those things matter because ultimately we're interested in good health and we're interested in living standards. So there's a sort of even further step down the results chain that, that we need to, to ultimately take as our, our ethical justification for being concerned about all of this. As I said, health is something that matters, and UHC matters only insofar as it helps us toward that goal. Um, but then we can talk about UHC initiatives, right? So I see Seguro Popular and the Thai UC scheme as UHC initiatives. They should, if they're working, help us down the road towards that UHC goal. Um, that's my take on that. On the um, on, on the other questions, on levels of expenditures, I mean, this, this whole discussion makes me super nervous, I have to say, and I'm, I'm often asked by people in the World Bank, so Adam, you, you know, you're writing about UHC, but what's it going to cost? Give us some numbers. And I remember last time around with the MDGs, when people were wanting to crank up, it, crank up the, the, the speed towards the MDGs, Adam, give us some numbers. What's it all going to take? There's Jeff Sachs, you know, saying this. What is, is he right? And, and... Bill is absolutely right. You know, this is a really hard question to answer, given we know so little about how much it really costs to do what we can achieve right now. Um, if you take Jishnu's work that I mentioned in India, for example, you know, Jishnu's finding that these people doing really bad job, actually not spending a lot of time with patients, and yet at the same time we hear this global debate about the need to send doctors to rural areas. You know, it's, it's, so, so what, you know, there's a disconnect here, right? We've, we've actually got doctors in rural areas in a lot of the world, and they're not doing a very good job. So maybe we should start by thinking, let's not send even more doctors who are going to do a bad job. I'm sorry, there are probably lots of doctors here, and I'm being terribly <laughs> offensive, but I'm somewhat overstating the case for, for, for the sake of argument. But, but maybe we should be thinking about ways to encourage them to be doing well to start with, and actually making sure the people who go to rural areas are the people who want to do a good job in the first place, which ties up nicely with this question about, well, what about medical education reform, and shouldn't we be thinking a little bit about that? And isn't it a chance, isn't, aren't we missing an opportunity here to ramp up primary care? And, and I'm totally sympathetic to that, but I would say it's not just about medical education reform. If you don't do a whole bunch of other things at the same time and make primary care um, a well-paid profession, a profession that's going to be backed up by investments in facilities and a whole range of other things that ensure that um, 
that when people get to the rural areas and do a good job on primary care, they're actually going to be held in high esteem by their colleagues. They're going to get paid reasonably well as well. Um, there's, a, there's a primary physician in, in uh, an island off the coast of Scotland who was paid so much to go there that he's now one of the richest men in the United Kingdom. The funny thing is he didn't want the money. He said, I didn't become a doctor. I went there because I wanted to go there. And they insist on giving me this truckloads of money. Um, but in some places you may need to do something like that. Um, and uh, social ideologies and the role of the market, a big, big question here. Um, interestingly, what we found in the, the World Bank case studies that Gita mentioned earlier is um, that countries are using um, UHC as a, an opportunity to rethink the way that healthcare is delivered, not the way it's financed. In fact, I think there's a consensus emerging, and I actually blogged about this a while back, long before the case studies came out, so I was right on this. There's a, there's a consensus emerging that public finance should be used to pay for health care, particularly of the poor. That, that's a consensus that's emerging across whole swathes of Asia and, and other parts of the world too. Um, but what is also emerging is that finance ministers aren't very convinced that public monies are being well used with the way health delivery works right now. So UHC initiatives around the world, what you see is a whole slew of arrangements whereby UHC is being introduced alongside measures to try to get better value for money in public, uh, in, in public expenditure. Um, Gita mentioned the RSBY program in India, that's, that's uh, one example. There, there are lots of other examples too. Not every country is doing this. I think China's a little bit back, in, in, in the, not quite in the front seat on this, and, and India's probably a little bit ahead. But there are lots of other countries that are, are doing this. So, so I think in terms of markets, there may be scope for using the private sector, subject to what Gita rightly says about how do you ensure that public money isn't used to, um, to, 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 to finance a whole lot of procedures that aren't necessary. But if you can ensure better value for money um, and, 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 and cover that um, problem, then, then maybe some contracting with the private sector, with publicly financed um, public, using public finance may be, may be part of the story here. So that's a sort of twist on the ideology story. Uh, qu quick answer. I totally agree with what Adam just said. Uh, I believe the UC is a goal, and I call it a noble vision. You move it toward it step by step, and I think what he brought out in his presentation is we need measurements to say how far are we moving toward it rather than just hold that up as I call rhetoric and then nations can declare we have achieved it and we need to be more empirical about it. The second point, again I agree with him, the world's experience shows if you worry if equity is a priority for your country, government has to take the major role of financing health care for the obvious reason. There are poor people who can't afford it. There are people who are uh, even middle-income countries, uh, I'm sorry, middle-income households may not be able to afford it, uh, to pay it on its own. I would like to add another point based on U.S. experience. And I worry about India's approach. Namely, United States demonstrate when you rely on many insurance plans, many different pairs, so-called, one, one dollar out of four in the United States are spent for administrative expenses, not for health care not for quality, not for services, it's for the administrators. You just go to any major hospital right around here, look at the whole floor of administrators, processing bills, dealing with the insurance companies with multiple rules. So to me, U.S. can teach you something 
in financing, you should go toward a single-payer system if you can. Then my last point is pretending to give this. My view is that countries have different capacity. Government has different capacity to make things happen. And we cannot generalize to say you have to go to the market or go to the government. Some governments are really incompetent and corrupt. You have to go to use the private side, even if it's not perfect, and with good regulation, as Gita argued for. But even if it's not perfect, it's going to do a better job than the government. But then there are governments actually can do a much better job than the private. And so I, I would suggest you look at the capacity of the government before you say it's public or private to achieve the universal coverage. Um, at the risk of extending a very long session in response to one answer, uh, Gita, one thing that you, one remark of yours uh, um, surprised me a bit. You said that there was a lot of variability between the states in how far they've gone down this road. But then, uh, and you said that uh, there were two things that caught my attention. One thing is, uh, as a measure, you talked about expected life, uh, life expectancy, that in um, some countries they could expect to live 20 years longer than people born in others. Second thing is, uh, the, the good places were um, uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. That's not where the money is. Is that right? These are, uh, Kerala, anyway, is not one of the richer states. No. So um, if the states in India that are furthest along the road to, UH, uh, to universal coverage um, are among the lower GDP states, um, <clears throat> what does this tell us about the importance of achieving greater expenditure? In fact, of dealing with this through financing in the first place. Um, oh, let me, um, let me clarify that. Um, certainly, both Kerala and Tamil Nadu and some of the other southern states are uh, up there in terms of uh, the proportions of expenditure. Um, that they actually, so it's not the total GDP alone that's the issue. Um, um, it's how much are they spending out of the public uh, system and how much are they getting, how much are they spending of what they get from okay. this government, from the central so government absolute as well. So oh, okay. both of those, um, they would be higher and many of the states that are really doing badly are the ones that are um, simply not willing to spend um, um, okay. at all and where the proportions are um, are lower. So we haven't sort of, there's no miracle here. No, okay. I mean, they are, um, they are spending, they're paying attention to it, um, um, and it is happening. Thank you. Uh, but if I may just say one thing on this goal tool question very quickly. Um, this has particular interest right now because of all this post MDG, post 2015, the big push towards declaring universal health coverage as the goal for the post-2015 uh, era. And I will say that I've been one of the people who's been arguing against that, saying that it's too vague, it's too broad, it allows too many people to claim every, the US is moving towards universal health coverage. You know, every government can, will claim that they're moving towards it in some fashion or the other. So the devil is going to be in the details. And if that is the case, we're much better off having much clearer, more specific goals than having something which is motherhood and apple pie. Um, and I particularly worry because in my other hat as someone who works on gender issues a lot, Women's empowerment, God, I wish I had never been one of the people who invented that term. <laughs> it can mean anything, and it does to anyone um, at this point. Absolutely useless in terms of getting us anywhere. Thank you. Uh, yes. I'm Donald Light. I'm from one of the other centers for ethics at Harvard. Harvard seems to have a, a plethora of centers for ethics. That's why we're so ethical the Edmund J. Saffer <laughs> Center, and I want to ask about a silent, powerful 
and, and rapidly widening threat to expanded, extended our universal health insurance. And that is um, the, uh, the practice that I think is pretty clear now of pharmaceutical companies to charge very high prices for drugs for life-threatening and seriously chronic diseases, raising those prices every year on last year's drugs. You notice that's what BMW does, raises its prices on last year's model. And then charging, uh, and then charging uh, uh, the, the now raised price level in what I call a market spiral pricing strategy. So you spiral the prices year after year. By the fifth year, it's nearly doubled, and then the new drugs are priced slightly above that, say 20% above that. Um, this is uh, already leading, I'm working with some people at MD Anderson Cancer Center, to uh, middle-class Americans <clears throat> paying a third of their household budget for one drug for the carve-out co-payments that now reach 35 or 40% for fully insured uh, patients in the United States. Um, my question is, in developing countries, and especially the countries that they regard as fair targets, which are not the, the terribly poor countries, but the uh, countries above that, what do, uh, do you regard this as a, as a powerful um, and silent and growing threat? It seems to me that the, the, the uh, discounting and tiering only helps to some degree, and they're working hard to delay or minimize generic uh, competition. Thank you. I think the United States it can teach the rest of the world what not to do. Uh, we have laws forbidden Medicare to bargain with pharmaceutical companies for prices. This is, shows the political economy and the, the kind of sad uh, state we are in politically. In other countries, you're going to hear later on Thailand as well as other countries. Precisely if you have a single pair you use that monopsin power to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies for lower prices. And, and so you do not just let monopoly derive from patent laws to charge you whatever you want to charge. I'm sure you know in the United States by comparison on brand name drugs, the studies show we pay on average about two and a half times what European Union countries pay. That shows you the kind of regulation we need in the United States. But then the question is, can we curb that? I'm optimistic, looking at the worldwide experience, you actually can, particularly if you introduce an organization like uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, like Great Britain, to look at the cost effectiveness. Um, one of my favorite subjects, and certainly one of the favorite subjects of many Indians working in this field right now, thanks to the Supreme Court's decision on the Novartis uh, case, which probably many people have heard about. Um, the, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the Gleevec Novartis uh, case on evergreening Gleevec, a cancer drug, in, um, which has been going through the courts in India and which finally the Supreme Court ruled against Novartis, but ruled in about the most comprehensive kind of judgment that you could ask for which basically means evergreening is out the window as far as India is concerned. Um, so there's a great deal of celebration about that. But in addition to that, we've also had compulsory licensing, which of course is the one that's allowed under Doha uh, to happen, but which very few countries have actually been using, and India itself hasn't been using terribly, terribly well. But we've had one case, and I know there's, there's at least three more drugs that are now uh, being targeted for compulsory licensing. So I think that um, we're on a roll on this one. And if we can do this, I think if one listens to the activism around this, around the world, there's a lot of optimism about where, uh, where we can go with this. However, 
there's a big danger somewhere else. Um, uh, one, uh, and that is, of course, in these regional, trade agree regional and bilateral trade agreements, of which um, India is right now, and I, I don't even know as we speak it may be happening, um, signing one with the European Union, um, in which the EU has really been pushing very, very hard for TRIPS Plus compliance on um, um, uh, patent um, um, IPRs um, and which by and large India has held out against up to this point, but I don't know in the end what's, what's going to happen. I think they're going to hold out um, uh, given the mood generally. I think the government will be in a lot of hot water if it gives in. However, there is something else which is more complicated and that is there are in these agreements also these investment agreements which allow international arbitration, um, which basically means the companies take governments to court. Um, and that has been happening, and they are allowed, and they go to this completely non transparent external arbitration process. <laughs> Um, where a multinational company basically can take a government to court for a whole range of things, um, your patent law, your anything, your, um, a, whole, a, a whole slew of things which we normally think of as part of the policy uh, space of a, of a national, um, national government. Um, and those have become, and they're not just operating against developing countries, they're operating against Canada. I think Australia was taken to court by the tobacco companies for its blank yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, 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 packaging and so on. Um, this is far more risky at this, um, at this point because what they can't get to through the trade agreements, they're trying to get through this uh, mechanism. And this is where I think if we're talking not about regulation country by country, but of a much broader global um, understanding of what can and cannot be in these, um, that's where I think we really need to, um, need to pay, um, pay attention. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm so gonna have to, we have such a long line about that. No. Yeah, I, I'm going to suggest that you group a few questions, and starting with mine, the, with uh, others. <laughs> since um, uh, you're showing uh, that you're willing to take some of the burden, we'll ask for the next three to be grouped. Okay. Um, so I'll try to be brief with the question, but I'm a little curious whether you think the issue here is a lack of ethical agreement about what the focus uh, or goals of universal coverage should be, uh, or whether you think there are political uh, issues that arise in all kinds of settings because of competing interests, and that the, that's what really is at stake in undermining uh, appropriate progress towards uh, the, those goals. I have uh, two questions. One is about uh, Adam Wagstaff's uh, green and red map. Um, it seems like if there are two countries, in one of them uh, there is rapid expansion of vaccination among the poor, but even more rapid expansion of vaccination among the rich, and another country where it's low among the poor, but even slower among the rich, you will call, your map will kind of give um, red to the rapid country and green to the slow country. What do you do about that? Um, second question is about a further way to complicate the Q picture. So when I think about the dimension of depth of, of financing, I worry about two kinds of things. One is how much of the cost people are made to pay at the point of service. That's very alarming if, when it's high, especially for the poor. It's a matter of fairness and all that. But I also worry about how much people are made to pay, period, if they are poor. So I also worry about high premiums, about uh, regressive taxes, if insofar as the taxes uh, pay, that, uh, pay for care. That can also be a matter of fairness. So maybe what we should have with respect to finance is somehow twice, I mean, two cubes or something like that. Uh, what do people think about that? Yeah. 
I wanted to uh, bring up a topic. Ident identify. I beg pardon? Say who you are. Oh, my name is Catherine Arad. I'm working with, um, actually, in ethics with some health students. Um, something that is mentioned and is indirectly implied in all of this, if you're going to develop uh, health care uh, universally around the world, and we would assume half of the world is not that well developed, this will be an enormous increase in all levels of health personnel uh, delivering this care. Uh, they will receive various levels of education and be employed in various aspects. This group in and of itself, because of its size, um, will wield weight uh, and influence. Um, so how should their education address considerations of ethics? This is a, uh, it's a powerful group in this country. Um, what will their compensation be? For example, recently uh, the U.S. determined that a medical student choosing to go into general practice, given the amount of cost of their education, would have to make a salary of $200,000 a year, and that would barely enable them to pay off their debts. And they would not be able to maintain a standard of living of which many of their fellow medical workers are. So is there any forward thought being put into this large army of people that will come forward and they will have their own aspirations? Anyone who <laughs> wants to speak to any of those points? Do you want to take the... Just would, uh, why don't each of you select one that you'd like to talk to? <coughs> Do you um, want to take the no, rest? No, we'll, we'll ask the next three yet. If I may, also on the, uh, uh, the pharmaceutical question, and then just one of these. Um, so I, I always hesitate to disagree with Bill Shaw because um, he's such a nice man. He's always been so nice to me. Um, but uh, on the pharmaceutical question, Bill, um, it, I totally agree with you. When we're in a country that, in your earlier response, is a, is a well-governed country, um, the, this, the monopsony story is a nice answer, right? You know, you can imagine um, uh, countries in the European Union falling into that category and using their monopsony power to uh, the advantage of the, the patient. But what if, and I use this hypothetically because if I weren't, I'd been out of a job, but what if you were in a country where the governance wasn't quite so good and there was a relative of the prime minister who was taking advantage of the monopsony power the government had to actually push up drug prices <laughs> to the health system dramatically and doing very nicely as a result of that. Um, is monopsony purchasing of drugs the answer in those countries? Not so sure. Um, on, the, uh, on the map, I, I totally agree that our uh, Depending on the circumstances, uh, you know, one would want to indicate uh, green is, is super good if it's also this, and red is really, really bad if it's also this, uh, and, and which goes to this question of, of being clear about the indicators. And Geet I know much less well, but, and I'm really nervous about disagreeing with her, but I totally agree that um, apple pie and motherhood is, is sort of, you know, kumbaya, problematic, blah, blah, blah. But... What if we could nail down some indicators and collectively agree they're good indicators, then would that persuade you perhaps UHC was something we could put on the uh, post-2015 goals? Perhaps couple it with some health goal that would be the ultimate goal that we'd be all about, but that for health system reform, um, some trackable, quantifiable indicators that everyone buys into that actually capture what UHC is really about, um, would that change your mind? I'm, I'm sitting on the fence on this one, as I'm supposed to, um, but I have blogged if you're interested about this and, and what, it might, uh, what it might look like. I would just uh, answer Adam's uh, rhetorical question, uh, say obviously uh, when government is corrupt, um, we know some 
sons and daughters of the prime minister and president actually get that job by purchasing drugs and the results will not be very good for the society. But I would push it one step further. Empirically, would it even be worse than have nothing or just a market? Okay, I would, and we don't have really have good empirical evidence, which even in a corrupt country, how much is wasted, that's my point. Uh, I will answer the question that Norman Daniels asked, is the lack of a consensus on ethical principles uh, or is it mostly political? I would, uh, my answer is uh, not trying to waffle. I think those two are really interrelated. The ethics that undergirds a society fundamentally impact on politics. And uh, so, the c first of all, I don't think, at least uh, my experience, I, it's not a wide empirical study, I do not believe that all the countries embrace what WHO declares. And on service, yes, they do. Who can you disagree about fairness and justice? But in reality, when it comes to, I call rubber meets the road, allocating resources, actually developing countries often we use the excuse, we don't, we are not there yet. This is the Western countries' values. And uh, they even signed the dec Human Rights Declaration. But partly though is, is impact on their politics. And uh, because ethics in a society affects the distribution of power, who gets voted in or what kind of form of government. And so these two, I, I will argue, are interactive. And, uh, but if I have to choose which one, I would say politics plays a stronger role than the lack of precise agreement on ethics. At least ethical principle is easier to agree on when you are divorced from politics or your own pocketbook. Thank you. Um, after hearing the different speakers and the question from the audience, I wonder if we shouldn't move from being theoretical that for pra practical people mean that the chances of implementation are quite low to develop theory based on what is possible and including in the equation the context, vested interest, and, um, and, uh, and the uh, uh, resources available. Uh, that is the question, if we shouldn't move from being theoretical to develop theory that based on what is possible in context and, um, and with our feet on the earth. Uh, to be fair to our panelists, uh, that's what they do for a living, and uh, they kindly agreed to come to our conference about principles, but they're all stretching, and uh, <laughs> 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 if, you go, if you go to their actual publications, Should I take that for an answer? Uh, no, the Hi, I'm Jeff Shu, radiology resident next door. Uh, my question is, with respect to UHC, uh, whose goal is it and uh, whose obligation uh, is it to pursue these goals? Um, particularly with developing countries, you have 
external actors who uh, provide a lot of aid and uh, health care delivery, foreign governments, uh, NGOs, um, they have their own agendas and priorities uh, which uh, may not necessarily coincide with uh, a goal of a government to pursue universal health care. Um, so do, do these groups have do, uh, some obligation? And if so, uh, how do you justify that obligation? I mean, I think it's, you can, you know, do it with a government, you know, citing fair equality of opportunity and so on. But, um, you know, when you involve sort of questions of global international actors, it's a little murkier to me, at least. Hi, I'm Richard Cash from the Public Health Foundation of India and the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, I believe, in fact, that most health care is quite affordable. And the reason it's not is because there is unnecessary uh, treatment that has been given and so on. You can do cataracts in, in India for $10, $15. You can provide care for almost, uh, say, 99% of what people have for very, very low cost. I buy drugs in India for one one hundredth of what they cost in the United States. The country that's really getting screwed is the United States. And you have no idea how badly screwed you're getting. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm really quite serious about that. You, you just, you have no idea how you're getting taken to the cleaners. Um, but, so the question I have is, is really this, is it ethical for a country to embark on a universal health care model without the appropriate regulations and standards that in fact would make this uh, uh, actually an equitable system. Uh, this, is, this ties back to what, uh, what Bill has said and what, and what Gita has said and what Adam has said. That can you really say that you're doing this unless you actually regulate and set standards? The, uh, the multiple, uh, the, the paper that you referred to by the way, Adam, is uh, highly controversial in India for a variety of reasons, some of them ethical, um, that uh, uh, who are you kidding? Why even bother to take a step? And why don't people step forward and say, this is not universal health coverage because you have not standardized care and uh, appropriate behavior? Uh, that's the question. Thank you. Um, I don't know quite to which question they're an answer, but I think the questions have sort of gotten mushed in my head a little bit. Um, um, but somewhere I wanted to address the norms question about goals. Is this really about lack of ethical agreement regarding goals, or is this about you know political interests that make it difficult to move uh, move forward? And I think the point that I was um, trying to make, um, uh, Norm, is that I think if we keep focusing only on the goals, that we're not going far enough. That actually there's an ethics to the problem of the path and the mechanisms that in, in terms of the can we get practical and real and on the ground, is actually a lot of what we have to deal with. And those ethical questions, uh, there's a lot, so much silence about that, in fact, largely anything seems to go at this point. And um, that, in a sense, is also linked to Richard's um, last question. Um, there's no guidance out there that says that is it ethical or not ethical to go forward with something like this without having a proper set of institutions in place. And yet if we try and do it without that proper set of institutions in place, you're quite likely to be setting up all kinds of perverse incentives, moral hazards, all sorts of things which are going to mean that in the end you spend tons of money, but God only knows what you get um, get out of it. But we actually don't have a lot in the discussion, and that was my bit about the cube, uh, it was um, um, that is telling us what to do. I mean, we found that out just by the practical thing of trying to struggle with it and realizing where we were not going to go 
um, uh, at all in the discussion. And so I would say not that the cube is wrong, but it does, simply doesn't get us far enough. And, not, and we need to start looking at the ethics of the pathways, uh, of the mechanisms, of the processes by which we are, um, um, we are um, uh, going forward. And I completely agree with Richard. I mean, my God, you guys don't know what's being done to you. <laughs> the cost of those drugs <laughs> is peanuts. It really is. Um, and um, even despite everything they tell us about who's, I mean, who's paying for it? You're paying for it. Your tax dollars are paying for it through government subsidy. That's what's paying for the glorious cost of development of, um, of, uh, pharm uh, of pharmaceuticals. I so. can we thank Novartis for the support for this? No, I Let me uh, qu give a uh, quick response. Uh, Julio Frank this morning uh, argued really there are three pillars to develop a health system. One is ethics, another is pol politics, political, another is technical, which is, pro um, and so I would argue actually those three play together and then uh, I forgot to mention, uh, since da uh, Norman Daniels asked the questions about is there a consensus on uh, ethic, ethical values, I thought your books, your approach answer that question. Namely, you says every society has to develop its own process. That involves a democratic process to actually agree on on it, and that means you don't think necessarily, uh, implies countries do not necessarily agree on one set of ethical principles, but you develop a process trying to reveal that. Then uh, one comment about um, whose goals, and they, particularly you talk about donors may have different goals. Uh, you're, that's a very a fair question. Uh, even domestically, it depends on the form of government, whether the leaders are really reflecting the goals of the uh, majority of the people. But in terms of donors, i like to point out Rwanda has done a wonderful job deciding on their own priorities. Then tell the donors, if you want to donate money, you will welcome it, but it has to fit into our priorities. So there are good examples how you can manage the donors. Um, talking of donors, um, <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, so the, the question about Theories based on what's possible. I think Dan's right. You know, we're all on this panel, at least, sort of, you know, people who are not actually ethicists at all. So, um, actually, much more familiar with with the the, the, the sort of practical side of this. I, I I didn't mean in my earlier remarks to to belittle Dean Frank's achievements in Mexico. That to me is actually a striking example of of a, a reform that really has been extremely well designed and well implemented and has achieved a lot. And what's fascinating is is the fact that the person who did that, Dean Frank, comes from an academic background, got his head around being a minister of health, and managed to keep an analytic mind while doing it and working out how to um, put together a package that he could sell to the finance minister uh, and, and the president. So if, if one does want to um, find someone who knows both the theory and the practice and has been there and done it, you would really just need to go no further than knock on the dean's door. Um, you, you have that person right in, in house um, and, and much better equipped to talk about any of this than, than any of us, or at least me. Bill, I'm sure you can talk wax eloquently on everything, but. Uh, but, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, we, we are, I hope. <laughs> um, so the, the role of. Um, just let me try and group these two questions on the role of aid agencies and, and also is it ethical to start on something when you don't have everything in place. Um, 
so the Thais came to the World Bank and said, we want to do universal health coverage. And the World Bank said, are you sure? Can you afford it? Have you got everything in place? Do you know what you're doing? And, um, and they said, okay, you don't want to help us, we're going to do it anyway. And that's actually their, one of the things they're most proud about, is the World Bank said, are you crazy? And they did it. Um, and good for them, you know, because to my mind what this is all about is realizing that there are a lot of people out there in the developing world, poor people, who have a really bad deal right now. And if you wait till everything's in place before you start trying to help them, you could be here forever. So my view is, you make a start on helping those poor people with what you've got. Hopefully you get a bit of help from the World Bank next time you come and ask, and, and other people, and, and you make some progress. But in, I think as Julio Frank said, the, the cost of inaction, particularly the, for the poor, is so high that I just don't think we can have everything in place. That said, I totally agree. There are some path dependency issues. Um, and, and I think the RSBY scheme in India illustrates some of that. Whether the problem is so difficult that it should never have been started, I'm not sure. And this is, you know, this is, I guess, where it becomes less black and white. Is it possible still to put in place a scheme in India that will counter some of these tendencies that have been seen in RSBY? I'm actually flying from here directly to Hyderabad in India, where I'm helping them evaluate uh, a rather different scheme called the Arogashree scheme, which I think has got in place a lot of the, um, the, the things one would need to have in place in order to try to, to counteract um, uh, over-utilization, over-prescription, and abuse by providers. Whether that's enough, for, even that, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, but I, I, I really think that, um, you know, there's, there's, in a way, what we're seeing in these World Bank case studies is that countries want to do universal coverage, um, and they're going about it anyway. So, in a way, the genie's out of the box or the bottle. It's a bit like the old wine in new bottle story. Once you take the cork out, you can't put it back in. So, my view is we should try to help, not sit on the fence and not say, let's get everything perfect before we start. May I just say one last thing, which one, one sentence, and that is that in all of this discussion, just to go back to something that came up earlier, is the business of the social determinants of health. It's just not in this discussion, and it may be the one that gives us the win-win rather than these trade-offs between money and this and that, because we're not, we're doing it too late, universal healthcare okay. in the way that we're talking is way down the pike from where it needs to be. Well, you spoke of a healthier